kind of want to build a race car. After a few short years of me promising to finish this car, I'm actually going to finish it. I have a plan. It's going to be three videos, and as everything always goes according to plan with no problems whatsoever, it's going to be great. I have the utmost faith that everything's going to go according to plan. This first video is going to be the accessories kind of surrounding the frame itself and making sure all that's in order. Then the next video is going to be the actual construction of the frame and the chassis and getting it driving. And then the third video is going to be finishing it all together with some track testing and actually getting the body done. We're starting with this because it was honestly the one that took the most amount of time out of this entire thing. And it's the biggest change so far. So originally I had, I don't have it right there. I had the cheap steering wheel that I bought off of eBay. In addition, all of the files and parts that I used for this are in the description below. They should be in an Excel spreadsheet as well as the files for all of these individual pieces and our base plate and everything like that. And I intend to do that with the entire project of the car as well. So eventually once the car gets done, all of the parts lists will be linked in the description below and uh, in that video and future videos. Anyways, so the only two pieces that aren't 3D printed are this piece that I made over on the lathe. I have a lathe now, which I did an entire video on and then didn't post because I have a lot of those. Anyways, that and of course this, which is laser cut. And you notice it is a little bit different than when it came off of the CAD because I changed things after I ordered this. So yeah, you know, uh, but they're updated in the file now and this should, should be good to go. So these rotary switches are just a single pin in 12 pin out rotary switch. We're only using about eight of those clicks, but that doesn't really matter. Basically, the idea is, is that we have one input and we have 12 outputs, or in our case, eight outputs. We could run five volts into this and then 12 different wires or eight different wires to each individual pin of an Arduino. But with three rotary switches, we run out of wires pretty quick or places to put those wires. And that's just kind of a mess. So instead of that, what we decided to do is we've decided to put five volts in and then a resistor soldered to each of the individual pins we're using on the way out and running that directly into our Arduino analog port. From there, we just use a simple voltage divider calculator. Basically, it's a really easy way to get 12 different options onto one specific pin. So now, ideally, we are in position one with a 220 ohm resistor. And then we can go to the next one. One of the things that led me down this was when I was working on the Formula One active suspension. And I realized that me zip tying wires running back and forth to controllers on one end or the other of the car wasn't really practical. So if we can design something with expansion in mind and a good base for some of these other projects that I want to tie into this. So this TFT display is from Adafruit, Adafruit, and it's their 320 by 480 TFT display. Technically, it's a touchscreen as well, but it has good light. I'm not using the touchscreen function on it, and we'll go more into depth on how I programmed this here in a minute. That's, that's where this came from. It actually only needs, I believe, five wires on the back, six wires, on seven wires on the back to run, and uh, it has a bunch of different options. So this is our quick disconnect. I already drove the pin out, but it has a spline on there and then this little plunger that when you push it in, frees up the spline allowing the quick disconnect. This is all well and good, but if we look at our rear panel, that only extends to there. It probably is fine, but I really wanna make it a little bit longer. And since I have a lathe, what we can do is we can take this and this this is actually almost an identical diameter to this. We can move this over an inch and a half, and then machine it out from there. And that way we'll actually extend that out to where it needs, and it'll look a little bit better too. So I'm gonna get that set up in the lathe.
Okay, we're gonna talk about the spaghetti here. flexible filament you can do this with it you can it does pretty well and it's kind of like soft and rubbery I decided to print some inserts for it so it'd be a little bit harder than it is sort of worked the biggest thing I feel to stress is that printing TPU is like hurting cats if the cats had no bones uh, it, it doesn't print great in my experience. Um, I haven't tried it a whole lot, but they did okay. What I found out that worked pretty well is I printed them and then I hit them with the heat gun for a while and it kind of got a cool rubberized texture. If anybody has any recommendations on how to print TPU and have it not be terrible, let me know. But uh, yeah. So anyways, we're gonna build this out and attach this before we attach this to the spaghetti. Hi, Future Wesley here. I hated the spaghetti. It was a complete mess and it was causing connectivity issues and I hated the Molex plug. So what we have now is a circuit board. This is just kind of mapped out on a breadboard. It's just spaghetti on a smaller scale at this point, but it would be almost nothing to get a professional motherboard like actually planned out and and, uh, and printed for this. So that's probably, once I double check this works, we get everything assembled, I'll order in a board and uh, go from there. The most important part, instead of going with a Molex connector, is you will notice that these have Cat6 receptacles at the end of them now. So instead of using that big old Molex plug with all of those wires coming out, we just run all of the data in this in CAT6. So this is the piece that we printed out for the Molex as well. As you can see, it has the standard Molex plug still on it. But what we need is actually the adapter to this, which is a CAT6 line plug, which takes our CAT6 line just little adapters here. And then will allow us to plug in and have the quick dis disconnect feature going onto the back of the lines on the panel. And for testing, that'll work out great. So these are just standard wall receptacles for CAT6, and this is a 3D printed adapter that just allows these two that, and then, Right, like that. And then it's flush mount, does pretty good. Then they have a nice little cable escape out the back. On our data side, that's very important for our I squared C connectors, and we'll go over, that's gonna be in the code side, so hang on for five seconds there. Everything's a version one until it's not. The wiring on this is actually super simple, contrary to what my wiring diagram looks like. We have obviously two dedicated grounds because I wanted, grounds are good, grounds are always good. Our 12 volt literally is just running through to run relays off the switches, off of these. And our five volt is broken up into two. One drives the display, one drives the reference voltage for our scroll wheels and for our resistors running through our switches. Three of the push buttons go back to the original Arduino to be handled there. One of them goes on to here to handle a timer. Two of the regular switches, the rotary switches, go to the original Arduino. One stays on here to handle this board. The display itself needs the seven lines to run, and that's pretty much it. There's not a whole lot going on. Somehow I managed to make it this. Remember, anything on this side of the board is basically a test apparatus to simulate what that other Arduino would be doing. So what I have here is four uh, potentiometers wired in like you normally would a sensor or something like that. And that way I can adjust those and make sure that um, my graphs and everything do what they're supposed to be doing. So let's make sure it actually works. So I don't have everything plugged in, but I have the stuff plugged in that actually goes to the Arduino. So we have our 12 volts coming in from up there. And if
Obviously, this is running at a fairly low refresh rate right now, um, just for the testing. And we'll go over all of the programming in this here in just a minute. All right, so obviously we're not putting this on this car. It's all this is getting changed, but I still wanted to see how the quick disconnect did and everything like that. So I have to figure out, oh, I actually put a uh, bolt on that. Good for you. Thanks, past Wesley. I need to use the right one. I just realized that I, that this is on upside down. Like the, the, the frame is on right, but it's, it's flipped. Yeah, cause the socket caps are supposed to be over here. Back apart it comes. All right, time for everybody's favorite segment. It's Wesley Night Live with Wesley Kagan, Bobby Moynihan. What's going on with that code? So a super useful tool that comes with this display is the Adafruit Graphics Library, which basically gives you how to draw boxes and circles and other letters like that and it's just a really handy tool and every single graphic in this is drawn in that. This board also has an SD card slot on the back that you can actually upload photos and, and use that to store photos. I haven't messed around with it a lot because, you know, less things to go wrong. However, I think it would be a really good way to free up a lot of space, which is going to be needed because as of right now, we are missing, still missing a few things, and we are at 88% uh, of program storage space on a micro or on the Uno. So, you know, <laughs> um, moving away from hand drawing literally all the graphics in this might be, might be kind of necessary. We also have a wire library. So all of the data moving from the main ECU on the car itself to the steering wheel is done through an I squared C protocol, which is actually a really cool protocol built in the 80s by IBM, I believe. But that limits us by two things. A, it's really nice because we only have to have two pins in out, digital two and digital three, but it also means that we couldn't run from one end of the car to the other, even with Cat5 and, and actually Cat6, as good as Cat6 is, uh, really, a meter is about maximum for what you can do. This would probably be a pretty good time to remind everybody that I am not a programmer. I am a guy in a garage, so my code is not going to be optimized. I'm sure there are much better people out there. This I'm going to put this up on GitHub. Mess around with it. Do as much as you want. So our setup defines a wire, and then we have a receive event, which brings in the data from the other ECU. That's where we kind of did some fun things on how to get data from one ECU to another ECU. So with I squared C, currently we're sending one bit at a time. All we're doing from our master Arduino that's sending all of this information over the wire is sending a block of numbers. Currently, I believe there's 14 numbers in the string to handle all of our data. What that allows us to do is have our Mega handle all of the heavy lifting, and all the Arduino has to do is take a number, pull it from the string, read it, and then print that and adjust the levels and the graphics into wherever it needs to be. I'm currently at 14 characters. 
In my experience, at around 32 characters, wonder why that happens, at around 32 characters, things start to fall apart, so I'd have to create another event to trigger everything like that. So within that string of numbers, it looks just like a string of numbers, we're sending temp oil, fuel attack, and uh, speed currently. So one of the biggest things is switching between menus, and it was very important to me that we didn't have all of the menus running all at once. So all we have is an if function that that loop, if it's reading that resistance, will run that loop. So none of the tire loop is not running when we are in our main menu loop and so on and so forth. However, the receive event runs every single time. So for example, if you wanted to put an error light, like you had an overtemp warning or a low oil pressure warning, if you wanted to put a special spot for that on the tire menu or the time menu, you could because that does run every single cycle. So let's talk about the gear indicator. I am by no means inventing this method of finding gear indicators. I believe Triumph or Motoguzi used this for quite a long time. They might still use it. But we're essentially reversing the formula for finding a gear ratio. So taking your RPM and your tire diameter and dividing all of that over the final drive ratio times the transmission ratio times 336, you can get your speed given an engine output. What we're doing is we're trying to find our transmission ratio. So we move our speed where that goes and then do that calculation from there. This is a G8620 six-speed transmission, so knowing the gear ratios in there, I just plugged it in directly for what that formula is going to output once it does the calculation, and just write that. The tire pressure page right now is mostly for show and to double check that my switches were working for switching back and forth between menus, but I'd like to build that out a little bit later, and again, all of that data can just come across my I squared C. Like I said, there's a lot of room for adjustability in this, so I'm leaving it a fairly open code base just to have the ability to adjust pretty much whatever we wanted from here on out. Um, there are a lot of placeholders, there are a lot of, still a lot of things under construction. This overall size of the program is a problem, so we're, we're working on that. I, I am going to experiment around with getting rid of all of that graphic stuff and then just basically building something in Photoshop, building the same thing in Photoshop, but like overlaying it with blanks and that way I'm just writing text and not all the lines. I think that would be especially useful in the second half where I draw out the car because yeah, that uses a lot. So anyways, that's code. If you notice, I completely changed the base plate as well, yet again. Um, again, I updated it in the files, but I didn't want to wait for another laser cut piece to come, so I just milled it out. And, uh, you know, it works. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we're, we're still at plenty. This is 1875. There is plenty of structural rigidity in this, and we have an ABS plate piece on the front and an ABS piece on the back. Yeah, it's, it's strong enough. So finishing up with the wheel here, I really like how this turned out. I think it's working great. I'd still like to clean up this back panel a little bit. I'd like to see some changes there um, in what we do with the circuit board. It's not rocket science to convert Arduino stuff to read automotive sensors, but I'd really like to see a more plug and play box or something like that. I'm running everything through an MS3 Pro, so like it's not as big of a deal. But again, that's a, that's a future video thing on how that is going to tie in, whether I go directly to the sensors or whether there's an intermediate box there to help convert it over to what gauges can comfortably read. Now that I've spent this much video talking about a steering wheel, let's move on to the rest of the car. So the original design was frankly not good in some places. This roll hoop is, is one of them. There's a reason I never released the CAD files for this is that's because they are a mess. These are going to be less of a mess, and I also have a lot more manufacturing capabilities available to me than I ever had before. A lot of it was spur of the moment, and I feel the general aesthetics and function suffered quite a bit because of that in both material cost and structural faux pas. However, I find it very important to explore the foolish, insane, and impractical ideas I come across because it usually takes you on a journey of actual, real, tangible discovery.
So starting right off in the front suspension, a few things are going to be changing. Actually, all of the things are going to be changing. All of this is going to be new. But a few of the mission critical things, these are just heme joints that are just running as lower ball joints. They will get replaced with proper Moog ball joints so that that's not going to be a safety issue. I was told that that was a safety issue even before I finished building the car. So like, that's been a known thing. The sway bar is actually just the factory Porsche Boxster sway bar, and we're changing that to an inboard to really help with our pushrod suspension. Um, and the pushrod suspension is completely shifting to where these actually move more to here. And we have an interesting system there that I'm still doing some testing on. I think it's going to be okay. It's a little bit more moving parts. It's a little bit more weight, but my biggest problem with these was how these actually came together a little bit, being that our wishbones are at an angle. So if we can get rid of that and keep these vertical, that would make me a lot happier. The battery is dropping completely to the lowest point in the car, and we're going a little bit up on the battery. The coolant lines are running on the outside of the car now instead of on the inside. The radiators are interesting. I have left enough space if I want to upgrade to the larger, like custom-made aluminum radiators. Those are still the factory Porsche Boxster ones. I don't hate those. Oh, I also kicked them at quite a bit of an angle so that they would fit under the nose cone a little bit better. I never had cooling issues with the Boxster, but this is a significantly larger motor. But we also have an oil cooler on that. so. Um, we have an option of stepping up to bigger radiators if we need, even with the new design, kicking them a little bit more flat. This is the factory Porsche Boxster steering rack that I actually cut down, just shortened a little bit off of this side, and it did well, uh, but it doesn't fit in there with the new pedal box because the old pedal box sucked. We ended up going with a custom steering rack, which doesn't break my heart. This is not, this is just a power rack that I took power away from. This isn't exactly the perfect design for a single seat race car. So that doesn't break my heart there, but this is still a good rack. So I'm keeping it around. One of the most visual changes you can see is the roll hoop, which, okay. Originally, I had this designed around the Lotus 49. Of a new machine. The roll hoop on those cars did not cover the helmet, so if you got into a rollover crash, you just died. So in that ethos, that's why this is the way that it is. In the effort of not getting yelled at on the internet, I designed a full roll cage. It has multiple points of contact. It has all of that stuff that's nice and safe. Also has a fire suppression system in case I catch on fire, whereas the original fire suppression was, was a fire extinguisher that I had over here um, that I could pretty easily reach. Pretty sure the fire extinguisher is supposed to be attached to the car. Well, I'm working on that. <laughs> Both are equally effective. The shifter, I like. Shifter's not going anywhere. This is a great shifter. I had to build this entire thing out of aluminum and it's just better in every single way. I love it. I don't think it can be understated on how truly terrible this pedal box was. It caused me so many problems. This is the famous pedal box that I originally looked at the price of the Willwood set and said, oh, that's too expensive. And then ended up spending double and probably eight hours trying to get this to work and it never worked right. We're going with the Willwood set this time. So now the rear suspension, also apparently known as part storage. Anyways, this is the point that I'm not super sure what I'm gonna do with shocks on at this point or the coilovers on at this point. What we're doing is we're getting rid of the rear chassis that we used from the Porsche Boxster that had that engine and transmission cradle that had the transmission mounts built in. That's all well and good, except now that we're narrowed up quite a bit in the back uh, and our suspension comes off of there, that's much better for our suspension rather than the like four inches that exists here. But that makes our pushrod suspension a little bit difficult because we don't have the width to do a similar setup to what we did here. Um, I still have a few ideas. But currently in the file, I believe these are just hooked up in a diagonal there. And while those will work, 
Uh, they're going to have to be very, very stiff springs just because of the angle that they're at, and that doesn't give me a ton of mechanical advantage. Compared to something like this, which has a lot of mechanical advantage. So I'm much happier shifting all of this in. We'll give this a lot better of a look, and we'll increase our length on our rear suspension so that this actually you know, behaves and can actually move further than the inch and a half that it could reasonably travel without going wildly out of camber. I guess to wrap this up, uh, a few things. I'm really, really excited to be working on this car again. I, I dearly love this car. I'm excited for the new frame. I'm decide excited to have a base to actually not zip tie things to. I'm excited to build this and I appreciate as always you guys watching these videos. Please let me know what you think of this and the steering wheel in the comments below. It's been a minute since I've uploaded a video, but uh, I try and keep up to more of the day-to-day -day stuff over on Instagram, so if you want, follow me over there. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, uh, comment below, and thank you guys very much for watching.